Welcome back everyone for today's video we see the return of none other than Grandmaster Hans Neiman himself to playing on chess.com. Now we put out a video yesterday covering everything that happened in regards to chess.com and Magnus Carlsen and Hans Neiman but he is back he is now playing on chess.com so he's playing in of course the premier event on the website which is Title Tuesday. Let's jump right into the action. So in Title Tuesday the players are playing a three minute time control with a one second increment per move. We're going to take a look at the first game we have. It's round number two where Hans is playing black against Vilka Spila. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing this name from Finland. So Hans won his first round game. Second round game, he's playing with a black piece. And let's jump into the action. So we have the move C4 here from, from Sapila, which is definitely uh, different. We have the English opening at C4, E5, Knight to C3, Knight to F6. And now we have the move Knight to F3. Sapila playing the classic four knights variation of the English opening. Now, this is something that was featured in the World Chess Championship match between Ding Loren and Jan Pomnesche. So we get e3, bishop to b4, we get queen to c2, bishop takes c3, and now we get the move queen takes c3. Now b takes c3 is one of the other moves that white can play here, but traditionally when white plays these structures, normally white likes to put the pawn on e4 when capturing towards the center. So for example, another way of looking at it, say we get e4, bishop b4, queen c2 takes takes, for example. Now white will play d4 and put a lot of pressure on the center because you have these two pawns on e4 and d4, which control a lot of squares. So back to the game we get takes we get queen takes c3 queen e7 being played and now we have the move b3 now most of the main lines feature this move d4 we get e4 knight to d2 and d5 many strong players have played this from both sides i will add this is a variation that i have looked at in the recent past and generally i think black is doing okay the reason is that even though white has the bishops this dark square bishop is very very passive on the diagonal so after say bishop after b3 bishop e6 if you go bishop b2 the pawn is or the, not the pawn sorry the bishop is behind this long diagonal and if you play a move like a4 after a5 bishop a3 knight before black gets a nice little hook here and the main issue is this dark square bishop no matter what white does so back to the game we get this move b3 from sapila idea is simple white does not want to commit to d4 white wants to keep this diagonal open for example after we get d5 here being played if white could go bishop b2 e4 knight d4 suddenly the diagonal is completely open for the queen and the bishop additionally if black were to place a d6 bishop b2 down the road maybe you can play something like d4 e4 and d5 to rip open this diagonal once again whereas in the other variation if you get the knight to d2 and d5 you cannot open up this diagonal so hans plays d5 here we get pawn takes pawn from sapila knight takes pawn and now we get the move queen to c2 and here hans plays e4 trying to be very aggressive immediately now as you will see from the bar things have gone wildly astray for white at this point in the game the opening has not gone how i was hoping for if white were able to get bishop b2 and e4 would still be good for black but here white could play knight to d4 trading the knights on d4 and now at least even though you have some light square weaknesses with say knight b4 knight d3 down the road it shouldn't be that big of a deal but in this position here after we get the move e4 being played white cannot really play knight to d4 because after knight d4 takes takes and say knight f4 with the idea of knight d3 or even queen g5 black is doing very well easy development bring the light square bishop out and castle the king either to the king side or the queen side so Sapila plays knight g1, Hans goes knight db4, and the idea is to try and take advantage of these weaknesses, specifically on d3 and c2. We get queen c3, Hans plays knight e5, trying to create the classic bastion here on d3, and already it's looking very, very bad for white. We get bishop to a3 being played here, and now Hans plays this move knight to d3, which is a mistake. Computer actually thinks that after either a5 or c5 here, black is doing very well. In fact, c5 is somewhat counterintuitive, especially in a blitz game, because after bishop takes, pawn takes. The reason this is so good is that down the road, let me just set up a random position here. Let's say we get a position like this. Black can use both the D file as well as the C file to try and activate both these towers. So c5 intending to capture on b4 and create these double pawns makes sense simply to use this open c file down the road again very counterintuitive but after a5 black would also be quite a bit better hoping for takes takes and then using the rook on the open a file instead hans plays knight d3 we get bishop takes knight knight takes bishop queen takes knight of course white cannot move the king out of check because then black will capture the bishop and simply has an extra bishop on the board and will win very soon 
So we get takes, takes, takes. We get e takes d3, bishop e7, king e7. And now white is relatively okay here. Now white still has not finished his development. You have this knight on g1 and rook on h1. But the problem is this pawn on d3 can become a serious weakness down the road if white is very precise. So we get rook to c1 here, an excellent move played by Sapila, because after, say, knight to f3, for example, black can now play moves like bishop e6, say you were to castle, and after c5, rook c1, rook c8, black is already quite a bit better because you cannot use a square for the knight on d4. Black intends to bring the other rook to the center and maybe go b5 and c4 down the road. But the main issue is that this knight on f3 just doesn't have this very nice square on d4 to move to. So we get rook to c1. Hans plays c6, protecting the pawn from being captured. We get the move f3 here being played. Now, this is a little bit too slow from Sapila, but what he is hoping to do is long-term, he wants to go e4, king f2, king e3, and capture the pawn on d3. So just to illustrate, let's say you just waste time moving the bishop back and forth. At some point, you're going to be able to play rook c3, capture the pawn, and then once you capture the pawn, you'll be able to bring the knight to c3 or d4, and you will win the game eventually. So we get the move a5 being played here. Sapila plays rook to c3, attacking the pawn on d3. Hans plays rook d8, guarding the pawn. Now, I do think that here the computer actually likes a4 because after rook d3, takes, takes rook a1, king to f2, bishop to e6. White has a big issue developing this knight on g1 as well as the rook on h1. Black can always bring the other rook over to a8 and a3 and go after this pawn on b3 while white has to figure out what to do on the king side. So black is winning, but again, it's a blitz game and you don't want to spend too much time. That being said, at this point in the game, with both players having only used 50 seconds, this would have been a good moment to spend like 20 to 30 seconds trying to figure out whether a4 was a good move. So we get rook d8 being played instantly. Now we have king f2 being played by Sapila. Hans goes a4, trying to open up the a file. Sapila plays b4, keeping the file closed. And now we get the move pawn to a3. So after a3, now knight h3 is played. And already it's getting very, very hard for Hans to play here because he now has two very serious weaknesses on both a3 and d3. White can bring the knight to attack the pawn. Additionally, if you were to take and give white these double pawns on the edge here, it's actually quite difficult for black to play because i have to say rook d5 and rook b1 you don't have a great response to rook to b3 attacking both of the pawns on a3 as well as the pawn on d3 and if we do get this position you can't really guard a3 and if you ever go to d8 then i then i just simply capture take this one so here it's already very very hard for hans to play and i think that practically speaking it's an easier position for white so we get rook to a4, trying to attack the pawn on b4. Rook to b1 is played, guarding the pawn. And now we have bishop to e6. And of course, knight to f4 is played. Now back here, the computer apparently thinks after knight f4, maybe white is better after rook takes b4, knight d3, rook a4, and something like rook b1, trying to use the open b and c files. But again, the show goes on. So we get rook b1, bishop to e6 is played here, and now we have the move knight to f4, and here we have bishop takes a2 being played by Hans, rook to a1, attacking the bishop and intending to capture the pawn on a3. We get bishop e6, rook a takes a3, rook takes b4, knight takes d3, and now after rook to b1, the dust has settled, a lot of the pawns have been traded on the queen side here, and it looks like, in fact, black is even a little bit better because now the pawn on d2 is a slight weakness and black can try to push this past b pawn down the board eventually. So we get king to e2, b5 played here by Hans, idea to play b4, forking the rooks on c3 and a3. But there is one big drawback to this move, which is that here white could have played the move knight to e5, threatening to capture the pawn and fork the king on e7 as well as the rook on d8. And at this point, it's very, very hard for black to play. Apparently, computer thinks after king f6 is still equal with knight c6 and rook d6, intending to play b4. But white also has e4 with the idea of playing e5, forking the king and the rook. So instead, we get rook c1, which is a move that you can play. You're down a little bit of time. You want to play something simple. It's a nice move. It dodges the fork, and it also forces black to trade off one set of rooks. So we get the move rook takes d3 here, which is a huge blunder from Hans. Now, this move essentially throws the game on the spot. Now, when we look at this position, Hans has a minute and 34 seconds on the clock, and he uses all of four seconds to play the blunder that loses the game with rook takes knight. Now, in this position, what Han should have played, he should have traded the Knights and played something like C5 and B4. Again, I'm not really convinced this is winning in the long term, or at least the perfect play. But considering the time situation, having 40 seconds more on the board here and an easier position to play, I do think, and also Han's playing someone who's 300 points lower rated, you do expect Han to win this position. 
Instead, Hans plays rook takes d3 after four second thing. And now his opponent, Sapila, is able to play his move rook to a7, checking the king. And now disaster is striking. If white were to take the rook on d3 after rook takes c1, black is an extra bishop. No worries, you should win the game. But after rook a7 check, now you have to move the king or block with the rook. And once you move the king, I can take the rook on b1 and your rook on a3 is no longer hanging because you moved it out of the danger zone. So we get rook takes b1 at this point. It's now a matter of technique. Will Sapila be able to hang on or will he get nervous? He's close to being someone much higher rated than him. Let's find out. So we get bishop c4, king to d1. Hans plays rook to d6. Sapila goes rook c7. Nice kebab here. Rook attacks everything on the 7th as well as the pawn on c6. We get bishop to f1. G3 played here. We get bishop c4 back. Rook to c1. King e6. Rook c3. King f6. King c2. Now white wants to play d3, putting all these pawns on the 4th rank and eventually capturing the c pawn. So we get king e5, d3, bishop d5, e4. Great move here. Trying to remove the bishop, which guards the pawn on c6. We got b4, rook c5 played. Now, d4 would have won on the spot as well, but Sapila tries to avoid any danger and goes rook c5. We get king to d4 played, rook to a5. We have bishop to e6, rook a6 here. Another move that is apparently not best from Sapila, but again, you look at the time situation, only a five-second differential. You do expect the higher-rated player here in general to play higher precision moves on average than the lower-rated player. So we got rook a6 now of... If Hans had been able to find his move king to e3, it would have been very interesting to see whether Sapila would have been able to win this. Because after rook c6 and rook d3, suddenly the rook is infiltrating. There's a nice kebab. All of white's pawns are very weak here on e4 and f3. And I think there's actually a very, very good chance that Hans would have won this game, even after making these mistakes. Instead, Hans plays king c5. We get rook a to a7. I don't know if this actually does anything since the pawn on f7 is guarded by the bishop, but it is what it is. We get rook to d8. Rook C to B7 here. Now, this move is a very critical move here because what it does is white wants to play Rook A5, checking the king and winning the pawn on B4. Hans plays Rook D4, which now loses because after Rook to A5 check, we get King to D6. And here, Sapila could have played Pawn to E5, checkmate, winning the game on the spot. It's just checkmate, game over. Instead, Sapila plays F4. Now, again, eight seconds left. Can't really be super faulty, but it, super uh, critical, I should say. Um... But he misses the mate in one and plays f4 instead. We get bishop d7, we get e5, king e6, and now we get king to d2. f6 played here, king e3, and after c5, rook takes c5. The rook on d4 is trapped. You simply have no squares to move to. We get rook d5, rook takes d5 is played, and here Hans resigns in the second round game of title Tuesday as he simply lost here. After king takes rook, rook takes bishop, white is an extra rook, mops up all the pawns on the king side, and that's GG, why not? So very, very tough second round game for Hans. He does lose. And now we're going to move to the next thing we want to look at. Now, I believe this game was played in the seventh round. Uh, Hans won quite a few games in a row after lo he lost this game. He drew one game. I believe going into this game, he was on four and a half points out of seven, if I'm not mistaken. I, it could have been three and a half out of uh out of six but i think it was he was on four and a half out of seven and he's paired against another young junior player one of the great players that we've heard a lot about in recent times tani Ottawumi. now tani is a fide master he's approximately 12 years old his story is very inspirational he was uh, i believe an immigrant came over to america with his family due to all the fighting in africa he i think started playing in one of just the local shelters or something took up chess and he's become very very good i would also add that tani is the only chess player in the world that i'm actually jealous of now you may wonder why am i jealous of tani the reason I am so jealous of Mr. Tani Adewumi is that maybe about a month ago, he actually was in this promo for this company, Uniqlo, and he played chess against none other than one of the goats, if not the goat of all time. I know I'm going to get a lot of comments in, comments, uh, in the comments uh, on this video where people say, ah, you're being so mean towards Novak Djokovic. But at any rate, Tani was able to play against the legend, one of the goats, the Swiss maestro, Roger Federer. So Tani got to play chess against Roger Federer. Now, not to go into a long... Um, Long story on this, but some years back, both Magnus and I played in this tournament called Bill, which is in the country of Switzerland. And I remember that I think Magnus had actually made a request to the organizer, wondering if it would be possible to talk to Roger, play against Roger, something of, of that nature. It never happened, obviously. I feel the exact same way that Magnus does. But alas, neither of us have had the opportunity to meet Roger, let alone play chess or tennis with him. So I, for one, am very, very jealous of Tani, and I'm always going to be very jealous of him, no matter what happens in the future. 
So Hans playing with the white piece here against Tawny, and we get to move E4. Now we have C5, knight to F3. Tawny plays E6, and we get this move B3. Now this is avoiding some of the open lines in the Sicilian with D4, where after takes takes, black can play the con with E6 and A6, or play knight C6 and play the time on off slash pulse and variations, variations which were featured in the match between Fabiano Caruana and Nijat Abislav in the consolation, consolation match of the FIDE World Cup. We, of course, did cover that in one of our recent videos. So we get b3, Tawny plays a6, bishop b2, d5 played her, Hans trades the pawns on d5, and now he plays g3, trying to set up the double fianchito by putting the bishops on the b2 and g2 squares here. And basically what he's doing is he's hoping that long term he'll be able to finish development, castle check quickly, and get a big advantage before black can finish his development because all these pieces are on their original starting squares. Black has played uh, four pawn moves to start the game. Or five, I should say. So we get knight to c6, bishop g2 is played, knight f6, queen to e2 check, Tawny plays bishop e7, and now Hans takes on f6. Now it's a very, very committal move, but it's a move that I like here. And the reason I like this move is because after takes takes, even though white has given up the bishop pair, it's going to be very hard for black to castle the king to the queen side. He'll have to move the bishop, the queen, and castle. And if you castle the king side, king is going to be completely open with the structure of h7, f6, and f7. So Hans castles, we get castles here from Tawny. Now, oddly enough, the computer thinks it's still okay, but it's very, very shaky. Probably if I were playing here, I would have played either bishop to e6 or bishop to g4, trying to castle the king to the queen side, rather than having to play with this very miserable pawn structure on the king side. So we get castles, knight c3 played here by Hans. Tawny plays f5. Now, this is a move that I really don't like because after f5, you hem in the bishop. You can't use this diagonal anymore. Now, of course, Tawny is hoping to be able to activate the dark square bishop, but nonetheless, I think this pawn on f5 and pawn on d5 will become weaknesses down the road. So we got knight to e5 played here, bishop e6. Knight takes knight, pawn takes knight, and now we have queen h5 played by Hans. At this point, Tawny's pawn structure is in serious ruins. You have the double pawns on c5 and c6, the double pawns on f7 and f5, and it just is very hard to play, even if objectively the computer thinks it's okay. So we have bishop f6, rook a e1 played here by Hans. We get bishop g7. Now we have knight to e2, another nice move here, trying to activate the knight towards the king side and pressure the bishop on e6, as well as the pawns on f7 and f5. Additionally, you can always go bishop h3 to target the pawn on f5 as well. So we get queen to f6, knight to f4 is played here. We get rook f e8, and now we have this move pawn to c3. Now, this move is maybe not necessary. Probably you can just stack the towers on the e file, but nonetheless, it's a pragmatic move, which prevents black from infiltrating with queen to b2. So for example, say you go like rook e2, maybe Maybe there's some queen b2 trick targeting the pawns on c2 and a2 so we got c3 bishop d7 now now knight to d3 played by hans to go after the pawn on c5 we get queen to d6 and now we have bishop h3 and tawny is in a lot of trouble here hans is really going after both of these weaknesses the pawn on c5 as well as the pawn on f5 so now we have c4 being played knight to f4 Pawn takes pawn, pawn takes pawn, and now queen h6 is played, trying to trade off the queens before losing the pawn on f5. We got queen f3, rook to e4 played, now we have bishop g2, rook a e8, and now Hans plays the move queen to d1. Now it feels like Hans has done something wrong because pieces are coming off the board here, and it seems as though the advantage is slipping away, but at the end of the day, the problem for Tawny here is the bishop is very, very passive on d7. Bishop on g7 is staring at a pawn that's guarded, and even though all the rooks can potentially come off the board, in the long term, due to all these weaknesses, the weak pawns on f5, the weak pawn on a6 as well, the bad bishops, white still has a very sizable advantage. So Tawny goes rookie seven. We got d4 here, building a nice little chain of two. Queen to d6 played. We got b4, bishop h6, and now knight d3 is played here, intending to play knight c5 and create a nice little bastion on the c5 square. So now we have f4, rook to e5 is played. Now this is an excellent move from Hans here because what it does, is it brings the rook to the center of the board. You want to play rookie one, stack the towers. And again, if rooks ever come off the board here, say rook takes e5, white can take with either the knight or the pawn. So Tawny goes f6, we got the swap, queen to d2 here, pinning the pawn. If you were to take the pawn, you lose the bishop on h6. So we got bishop g4, rook to e1, king g7, and now after takes takes, we get the move knight takes f4. And now white is up a pawn. There's still a long way to go here, but the big problem for Tawny after takes is that Hans does not have to play queen takes bishop. If you were to take after queen e1, bishop f1, bishop h3, queen c7 check, and king g6, you would simply be getting checkmated on f1 on the next turn. 
But Hans here can capture with the pawn. And the big issue is that now all of White's pawns are on dark squares, and we have light square bishops. So these pawns on d5, c6, and a6 are big weaknesses, while the black bishop can never touch the white pawns, which are all on the dark squares. So we get queen e6. Hans plays bishop f1, trying to win the pawn on a6. We get bishop f3, and now h3 is played to stop queen g4, which would lead to checkmate. Queen f5, queen e3, we get queen g6, king h2, bishop e4. And now Hans very correctly plays move queen to g3, trading off the queens, and now white will win the pawn on a6, and the rest is very, very straightforward due to the fact that the white pawns are on the opposite color of the bishop, and there's really nothing left but basic technique. Game concludes with king f7, takes, takes, bishop a6, king e6, king g3, king d6, bishop e2. Really, all these moves are pretty straightforward. Not a whole lot needs to be said. We got f5, g5. If you were to take back with the pawn after bishop e2, now the h pawn would start rolling up the board, and it's a very simple win. And after g5, f4, Hans again trying to create the pass pawn. We got bishop d3, takes, takes, h4, takes, takes, king e7, king g5, bishop e4, f6, king f7, bishop d7. And now Hans wins this game. He... Connie resigns because he will lose the pawn on c6. And once you lose the pawn on c6, now the wide people simply roll down the board and it's GG. Why not? So Hans wins this game. He's starting to fight his way back into contention. I believe after this win, he was now on five and a half points out of eight. I could be wrong on this, but I'm pretty sure that I have my facts correct. So Hans wins this game. He's on he's he's on five and or sorry, it's on five and a half out of seven, I should say, not five and a half out of eight. He's on, I believe, five and a half out of seven. He's rolling into it. Uh, and he's starting to do, starting to pick up speed and momentum and get into contention to potentially win the title Tuesday event in his first event back on chess.com. So now let's go to the very next game. This is round number eight. Hans playing with the white pieces against Dimitri Draken. Obviously getting some soft repairing since he lost that second round game. But now he finally starts playing against some of the big boys. The 2,700 plus player, very dangerous opponent, Dimitri Draken from Russia. So this game starts with d4. We get knight f6, c4, e6, knight f3, b6. Classic Queen's Indian from Andrekin. Now this famous streamer, Hikaru Nakura, also played the Queen's Indian in the recent FIDE World Cup. You might want to watch his videos on some of his early matches in the event if you want to find something out about this opening. So we get g3, bishop b7, bishop g2, check, bishop d2. We get a5 played here. Now again, Hikaru in his match against... Um, against Karthik Van Katamaran, did play his move bishop to takes d2, and the game was drawn very quickly. But on Draken plays a5 instead. We get castles, castles, bishop f4 played here. Hans does not want to trade the dark square bishops. He wants to put the bishop on a nice diagonal, aiming at the pawn on c7 and the knight on b8. We get bishop e7, knight to c3, knight to e4 played here. Now the problem for black, of course, white has a lot more space in the center of the board. If white could end up playing something like knight a6, queen c2, knight b8, and e4, white has a massive spatial advantage here. All these pieces, very, very passive, no pawns in the center, and white will simply run down black very soon. He'll mow him over. So... We get knight e4 here. Also, as I've mentioned on many videos, one of the basic themes in chess, when you have a lot less space, you look for two things, pawn breaks or peace trades, specifically knights and bishops. So we get knight to e4. Hans plays h4 here, very much in the spirit of Magnus Carlsen, his great foe. Magnus has actually started incorporating h4 a lot into many of his games in recent times. This is also something that Alpha Zero and Stockfish highly recommend, which is push and p on the king side, Harry 4. So... We get h4 here, d6 played by Andraken. We get queen to c2, knight takes knight, pawn takes knight. Now, the reason Hans captures with the pawn here is if you were to take with the queen, after a move like bishop e4, it's going to be very hard to push e4 in this situation. And black has very easy development with knight d7, followed by either c5 or e5. So we get b takes c3, threatening to play e4 and take the big white center. Additionally, there's a very nasty threat, which is if you were to play, say, a random move like a4, white can play knight to g5, which wins the game on the spot. It creates a knight fossil you're targeting the bishop on b7 but you're also threatening mate in one on h7 so after bishop takes g2 queen takes h7 is game over you lose immediately and after bishop takes knight here white well, can take the bishop on b7 and if you move your rook i take the bishop attacking the queen and if you were to take the bishop i take your rook and after bishop h6 bishop g2 white has a rook for a knight and white should win the game very shortly so there's a lot of venom to capture with a pawn. White also has a third option down the road, potentially, which is say you were to play with like bishop f6. Maybe at some point you can even go c5 and rook b1 to use the open b file as well. 
So we get the move queen c8, guarding the bishop and stopping the fossil with knight g5. Pawns plays knight g5 anyway. We get pawn to g6. We get e4 here. And now white actually has a big white center. But on the other hand, you have this isolated double pawn on c4, which can become a very serious weakness down the road. On the other hand, white wants to play for h5, maybe attack on the king side, and you never know what will happen there. So we get knight to d7 from Andraken. Idea of e5, c5, or bishop a6 still all in play here. And the show goes on. We get bishop to h3, played by Hans, trying to activate the bishop onto a nicer diagonal. Down the road, maybe you can play something like d5, and this bishop is really well placed. And with the pawn on e4, unless you're going to be able to play e5 opening up this diagonal, which in this case is not a good move, it's very hard to justify keeping the bishop here. So we get bishop h3, queen d8 is played, rook fe1, we get knight to f6, rook a d1, knight to h5, bishop to e3, and now we get bishop a6 here. Black trying to finally go after this pawn on the c4 square. And in this position, um, after bishop a6, we get bishop to f1, queen to e8 being played, bishop d3, we get rook to d8, and now we have this move queen to e2. Hans trying to shift his queen over towards the king side and eventually try to play f4, e5, maybe even g4. On the other hand, it's very hard because now this knight on g5 is here. It's always being scoped out by the bishop on e7. So it's not so easy to push all the p on the king side. So here we get queen a4 from Andraken, and this is a very, very bold move from Andraken. Andraken sort of getting tired of being very passive. He tries to lash out and put maximum pressure on the pawn on c4, as well as the pawn on a2. So here we get king to a2 being played by Hans. The computer likes e5 with the idea of g4 and the knight not having a square. But again, a very committal move that I don't think is realistic. So we get king h2, knight to f6 being played. Now we have knight to h3 by Hans trying to reroute the knight to f4 and maybe play for this move h5. So now we get e5, a nice move from Andrake and stopping white from jumping with the knight. Also stopping white from pushing e5. And now it's very tricky for white to play. Here, Hans plays f4, lashing out with this move, trying to create some counterplay immediately. Now, it's interesting that the computer likes f3, creating the classic bathtub formation in addition to having the big white center. A bathtub and a big white center makes a very happy day. So, instead we get f4, very logical move. Hans way down on the clock here. Now, one thing that we haven't been talking about a lot is Hans' time management has not been good in a lot of his recent over-the-board events. He has not been using his time very well, and he's made a lot of blunders when he gets low on time. And in this situation, in this blitz game, it's different than over-the-board, of course, but you still have to manage your time, and in some ways, it's even more critical in blitz than over-the-board. So we get rook f8 being played here by Andraken. We get knight to f2. Now we get bishop f8. Very logical moves from Andraken. But at this point, this is a situation where Andraken probably should have used more time and tried to come up with a concrete plan. But Andraken being up 30 seconds decides to try and play simple moves. But after bishop f8, now it starts to get very dangerous because Hans can take and go bishop g5, pinning the knight on f6. We got bishop g7 being played, and now Hans plays the move d5. Again, both players getting a little bit low on time, and Andraken blunders with this move, bishop c8. Computer actually wants c5 here, trying to lock this weakness on c4 permanently, and peasant would be a horrible move, because after queen takes pawn, now all of your pawns in the center of the board are under a lot of pressure. So we got bishop c8 instead, which is a huge blunder here from Andraken. And Hans spots this move c5 instantly, which creates a massive threat. Now, the computer wants to play queen a3 here, and after takes, takes rook b1, something like queen d6, and maybe you're still in the game after queen e3, knight d7, but at any rate, it's very hard to play. Instead, Andre can decide at this point that it's time to go for the big cheese. He takes on c5, we get bishop b5, queen a3, and he assumes that even though he's down in exchange here with a rook for a bishop, his moves should be easier to play, and of course, he's up 14 seconds on the clock. So we get queen c2 from Hans, and now Andragon plays c4, an excellent move, so that now the queen has all kinds of squares on this nice diagonal. In this position without c4, the queen is kind of a little bit boxed in here on a3. There just aren't a lot of squares to move it to. So we get c4. Hans plays rook to f1. We get queen to c5, and now Hans tries to simplify with very limited time on the clock, and he makes some huge blunders. He takes on f6, and now he plays knight g4, which throws away any advantage whatsoever. Now, Hans is very low on time here, so he decides to kind of go for it, but he simply overlooks one problem. 
After trade knight g4, bishop g4, and rook f6, you figure, well, white has two rooks and a queen. Black has a queen, a rook, and a bishop. You simplify, you'll be winning. Now, if you could get one more move in with, say, king g7 and rook df1, you would be winning here because the rooks are too, too active, and it's too easy to make moves with the queen and the rooks on the board. Bishop is simply not able to touch anything on the g4 square. But unfortunately, after rook f6, this does hang. Bishop takes rook on d1. And now, just like that, Hans has thrown away any advantage, and he's struggling to survive. So we get queen takes d1, Andraken plays queen e3, we get queen to f1, queen takes e4. Now again, these moves are not the absolute best moves here. Computer actually wants rook to b8, activating the rook to b2. But again, low on time, both players moving quickly, we get some inaccuracies. So we get queen e3, queen f1, queen e4, rook f7, queen takes d5, we get rook c7, rook f8 played by Andraken, and now Hans trades into the endgame. Now after takes, takes, check, king h3, rook a2, and rook c5. This position should be a draw, even though black is an extra pawn for the following reasons. First reason is that say you get um say you get some position even like this. With black having an extra pawn on the board, it's still a draw due to the very passive king that's cut off, and the fact that white can put the rook behind the pawn on a7, and this would just be GG. Simple, easy, theoretical draw. So there are a lot of trumps in the position for Hans that mean he should draw the game. But after rook c5, the show does go on. He's low on time here. Let's see what Andre can, can do. So we get e4. Rook to e5 being played, rook to a4. We get to move king g4. And now it's very clear that Hans will draw the game because he's bringing the king closer to the center to capture the pawn on e4 or the pawn on a5. We get king f7, king f4, king f6. Now this is a tricky move here from Andraken because he does actually tempt Hans into questioning whether he can trade the rooks on e4. But you cannot trade because this is an outside pass pawn. And eventually white will lose the game after a move like king e6, king d4, Let's say h5, we get king to c4, a4, king b4, king to d5, takes, and king to c4. And now after king a5, king c3, the black king gets over quicker than the white king. Let's say king b5, king d4, king 6, e4, d6, f3, e6, takes here, takes, takes, king g4. And now the king is behind the pawn, and you simply push the p, get a new queen, and win the game. So this move, I think, definitely sort of tricked Hans a little bit. He starts hesitating, not 100% sure, and he ends up playing rook b5 after a two-second think. We get rook to a3, king e4, rook takes c3, and now Hans Neiman flags in this position. Now, he's so close to making a draw here, but unfortunately, he runs out of time. And I think the reason he ran out of time was very specifically this king f6 move tricked him because he tried to calculate in the split second whether you could take on e4. He used a little bit, much, little bit too much time. And now after rook takes c3, flags. Now, the game would have been a draw in a classical format after rook takes a5, rook g3, king f4, rook g1. Let's just say check, king g7, rook a5, king h6, and a move like king f3. And with a 2v1, black has an extra pawn, but all the pawns are on the same side of the board, so neither side can do a whole lot. So this game would have ended in a draw. So with this loss, Hans drops to five and a half points out of eight, and the dream of trying to win title Tuesday effectively disappears or vanishes because in general, the winning score is never less than nine points out of 11 that has won on multiple occasions. So Hans ends up losing this game, and with that, he ends up on five and a half points out of eight. He would go on to draw another game. He lost, I believe, in the final round to um to an im and he ends up on a score of seven out of 11. now not a great score obviously his first tournament back but at any rate it's certainly not what he was hoping for so at any rate you guys i hope you have enjoyed this video make sure to hit that subscribe button below if you haven't already and i'll be back tomorrow with a recap after the chess champions tour begins on chess.com featuring magnus carlson and other top players see you guys bye